Hello. This lesson is going to be about interference and it follows chapter 12.2 in the textbook and leads straight on from uh, the first chapter in Waves 2, 12.1, which was uh, about superposition of waves. So if you uh, not sure about that, you perhaps need to go back and have a little look in your book. Anyway, uh, what we're going to cover are the uh, learning outcomes which are shown on the screen there. So um, there's a bit of bit of knowledge to recall and understand, which you're going to have to be able to use to explain certain situations, and you're going to need to be able to apply practical examples. So we're going to be explaining those terms which are uh, in uh, colour text. So uh, if you look at that picture there, that um, show is straight out of the textbook, obviously, um, shows patterns caused by raindrops falling in a puddle. And you can see that as the raindrops uh, drop into the water, they create these patterns where they overlap. And those patterns are caused by interference. But uh, the patterns don't stay very long, then they're, they're not uh, persistent. And that's because the waves hit the water in a very random pattern. To see uh, a stable interference pattern, then we need uh, a slightly different situation. And that's what we're going to go and uh, talk about here. So if we just quickly think back to 12.1, the highlights are that um, when two waves meet, they uh, add together or superpose. And uh, we need the, the concept of phase here to understand what's going to happen. So if the two waves uh, arrive in phase, in other words, two peaks arrive at a certain point or two troughs arrive at a certain point, um, then that means that the wave, which is the combination of the two, the two superposed waves, um, will have a, a larger wave, sorry, a larger amplitude than each of the two individual waves. Just spotted there's a typo on my PowerPoint, you see. Okay, and well, that's called constructive interference. On the other hand, if the waves are out of phase, in other words, a peak arrives at the same time as a trough, and if they're equal amplitude, then the superposed wave, the resultant, if you like, of those two, uh, has an amplitude of less than the individual waves, or perhaps zero. And that's known as destructive interference. Okay, so um, we need to understand this idea of coherence. So the diagram shows um, two waves, A and B, which uh, have different uh, phases. So in the first diagram you can see that they're 90 degrees out of phase. So uh, A is ahead of B. Now just think about that for a minute because the red line A is to the left of B and that might suggest that actually it is uh, behind in some way because being to the left might, might instinctively make you think that. But think of it like uh, that dotted line being a time axis the peak, the first peak from A, will arrive at, a, at a, an earlier time than the peak of B. So A is leading B, it's ahead. So uh, if it is 90 degrees out of phase, then it would look like the top two diagrams. If you notice that the second one is just, just the reverse of the first. Um, so you might say relative to each other, one of them is a phase difference of 90 degrees and the other is a difference of minus 90 degrees. The third one, obviously, is where they are exactly antiphase, out of phase, 180 degrees. So if you think of a circle, 180 degrees is half a circle. So if they're 180 degrees, that's half of a, a wave cycle. So therefore, they're antiphase. And then the, the, the fourth one, obviously, is where they are in perfect step with each other. So they're in, in perfectly in phase. So we measure that difference in phase, usually in degrees, but, but maybe in radians. And the way to think of it is if 360 degrees in a circle, so 90 degrees is a quarter of a cycle. So if you look at the red line of A, that is one cycle. So 90 degrees is a quarter of a cycle. 180 degrees is half a cycle. OK, so I just said that. Um, if it's 180 degrees, then they're out of phase. Um, so what we mean by a coherent source, uh, or coherent pair of sources rather, is that the phase difference between them is constant, it doesn't change. And we say that that's coherent. 
So we, we see these interference patterns with lots of different types of waves. We see it with water waves. Um, we're going to have another look at a water wave interference pattern in a minute. It happens with sound waves and it also happens with light waves. So uh, here's an example with sound. If I've got two loudspeakers um, which, are said, which are coherent, that would mean that the phase difference between them is constant and also uh, it would have to be true that the frequency of the wave they were producing would be the same. So if you were sitting in a room listening to these speakers, they wouldn't be making music, they would be producing a single tone. And uh, depending on where the listener is positioned, the, the waves reaching that position might be in phase or out of phase. So the, the um, speakers are obviously producing um, longitudinal waves, compressions and rarefactions instead of peaks and troughs. And at certain points, if you place a microphone, uh, microphone there, then there would be constructive interference where uh, two peaks met or two troughs met. And at other places, there would be destructive interference where they're they're out of phase. So you'd put, if you'd if you're listening with your ear, if you were uh, moving around in a room between those two speakers, you would hear areas of louder and quieter sound depending on whether you were in a zone of constructive or destructive interference. Obviously, you don't really notice that normally because who sits in a room with two speakers producing exactly the same frequency of sound? I certainly don't. Right, so here's an interference pattern uh, of water. So the uh, sort of dark shape at the bottom is um, it, it, in the ripple tank with there's two little dippers that are just touching the surface of the water and they're vibrating and they're vibrating with a constant frequency. So that means this is a coherent source of water waves. Those two uh, sources are emitting waves of the same frequency and depending on where you're positioned on the surface of the water, there is a, a, a certain phase difference between the waves. So the, you have patterns of maxima and minima. So looking at the photograph, you can see uh, that the light and dark represent the peaks and troughs. And you can see that if you look to say the far left of the diagram, you can see an even pattern of waves coming from the left hand dipper as it's producing its, um, its waves and the same on the right. But in the zone where the waves from the two sources meet, you've got a different pattern. And if you look carefully, you can see areas where there's constructive and areas where there's destructive interference. So uh, obviously where two wave crests meet, uh, and they're uh, in phase, they've got constructive interference, you get a larger amplitude and therefore you get a bigger peak and areas where uh, it's destructive, where the amplitude may be zero if the, uh, if the wave crest exactly meets with a wave trough. So just uh, zooming in a bit on that picture, uh, I've, I can, I've marked one wavelength there, if you can see that's the distance from one wave crest to the next and you can see that uh, if you make that measurement anywhere on the diagram the wavelength is the same so this is a, a coherent pair of sources now we we'll, I want to identify the points on this photograph where there's constructive interference so the waves travel out from the two sources um, and depending on on the position on the water tank where the place where they meet they, they'll most likely have traveled different distances from their source so if they've traveled different distances, that means that they, they will not be necessarily in phase. So there's, there's this idea of a path difference. So you could mark a point and then you could measure the distance from each source and uh, it probably would be a different distance. So if the path difference is zero, so one of the points up the middle of the diagram, or if it's a whole number of wavelengths, then those waves will be in phase. Uh, and so at those points, we'll get constructive interference and we'll get extra big uh, peaks and extra big troughs. So on this diagram, say that point there, you can see that uh, the path difference 
is the difference between the length of those two red lines and that produces a uh, at that point there a place of constructive interference so an extra big crest and an extra deep trough there's another one there's another one there's another one that continues out so what about destructive interference well it's pretty much exactly the opposite so if the path difference to a point is an odd number of half wavelengths then the waves will be anti-phase they'll be exactly out of phase okay just think about that for a moment odd number of half wavelengths so if they are one half a wavelength out then that's obviously 180 degrees that's exactly anti-phase if they were two half wavelengths out an even number that's the same as one wavelength they'll be in phase if they were three half wavelengths in the path difference, obviously that's an odd number. So that's the same as being half a wavelength. That's the same as being 180 degrees. So they're exactly anti-phase. So at those points, we'll get destructive interference, and that will be minimum amplitude, maybe zero. Maybe it'll be completely flat, where there ought to be a wave. So imagine that point there. We've got this green line, that's the distance from the left hand, right hand source, and the other line represents the distance from the left hand source. So at that point there, that is a place of antiphase, destructive interference. The two waves essentially cancel each other out, and we get minimum amplitude. And there's another spot there, and another spot there, and another spot. And if, if you look at that pattern, then you, you can see elsewhere on the, on the uh, photograph where there are other areas of constructive and destructive interference. Right, so um, this diagram is taken straight out of the book. It looks a little bit confusing at first, but uh, let's just talk it through. So you can see uh, the waves, the water waves, um, are obviously moving from left to right in this diagram. This could be a, a visual representation of two a pairs, a pair of sound waves, possibly. Um, but source one and source two, the waves are travelling out, and you notice those curved black lines representing the wave fronts uh, at any place where you measure the waves from uh, one particular source. The wavelength is the same. The distance between each wave front is exactly the same. So, uh, because the two sources have the same wavelength, then we, this is a coherent pair. So uh, first of all, let's look at that pair of sort of bluey purple lines. The distance uh, A and the distance B, if you look at the difference in path length, that is exactly zero. So that means that they are in phase. So that means there'll be constructive interference at that point. There'll be a maximum. OK, notice, as it says in the study tip there, those two terms, path difference and phase difference, might be confused. So just make sure you're clear about that. Path difference is a length and phase difference is essentially an angle measured in, in degrees or radians. So um, if you look at the pair of green lines, the although the at that point there, the wave arriving at that point has travelled a distance E, and the wave from the nearer source, source two, labelled F, that's a different source, but if you different distance, but if you calculate the difference in the path length, then at that point it turns out to be an exact number of wavelengths. In this case. 2 lambda, 2 times the wavelength. So these are in phase. So you will get constructive interference at that point there. Now look at the red lines on this diagram. So the distance C is greater than the distance D. But if you subtract one from the other, it turns out that the difference is half a wavelength. So because the distance is an, a diff path a difference is an odd number of half wavelengths, one half wavelength, then that means that will be uh, destructive interference at that point. So path difference is measured from each source to a particular point which is receiving the waves from the two sources. And from measuring that difference in the path length, you can calculate whether they're going to be in phase or out of phase. 
Right, so if you remember the photograph of the ripple tank, there was sort of a, a radiating pattern, and this um, uh, diagram, again, straight out of the book, is it just trying to explain that. You can see the dotted green lines represent maxima. In other words, everywhere, every point along those green dotted lines is a place where the path difference is um, exactly two, uh, well, the top one is two lambda, but each of the green ones is a whole number of wavelengths. And therefore, um, they, those are all going to be in phase, and so there's, they're all going to be places of constructive interference. So they're going to be maxima, in other words, where the amplitude is going to be a maximum. Okay, and then you look at the purple lines. Well, the purple lines represent places, um, all of those locations, the path difference is an odd number of half wavelengths. So those places are all exactly antiphase. So there'll be places where you'll get destructive interference. And then, of course, uh, you've got that red line in the middle, which is uh, all of those places along those lines have a path difference of exactly zero because at all of those points the waves have travelled exactly the same distance to reach that point. So if you look at that diagram and compare it with the a photograph we looked at a couple of slides ago, which you can do by looking in the textbook, um, that is explaining how that pattern looks like it does in the photograph. So we've talked about sound and we've talked about Water waves, light is a wave. We've done a little, little talk about light. Uh, are light sources coherent? Well, actually, most everyday light sources are not coherent. For two sources to be coherent, um, they've, they've got to have the same frequency. So if you're standing at a particular point, we say that two sources are coherent if there is a constant phase difference between the waves that are arriving and also that those two waves are the same frequency. Now a filament lamp, or in fact most uh, everyday light sources, produce light with a range of frequencies, not a single frequency, and therefore they're not coherent sources. Um, so, uh, oops, another typo, so you can't use filament lamps to produce interference patterns for light. We, we, um, for that we would need some kind of coherent source. Um, some of you may know what a coherent source of light might be, but we're going to talk about that in the next lesson. So we don't need to worry about that for now. Right, so a summary then of the ideas that we've covered. Uh, first of all, two sources are coherent if they emit waves of the same wavelength and with a constant phase difference. At any point receiving waves from a coherent pair of coherent sources, the path length from the sources is likely to be different. Because there's a difference in path length, that causes a phase difference. And if we've got, um, at, at any given point, uh, if the waves that meet have a difference in path length, which is an odd number of half wavelengths, that means we get destructive interference. They're antiphase, 180 degrees out of phase. And then, of course, the opposite of that is when at a point where the waves meet and the difference in path length is either zero or it's a whole number of wavelengths. And there they are in phase, so you get constructive interference. Right, so that's a summary of the knowledge. We need to be able to apply that. So uh, there are some examples I'm, I'm going to talk through, but there are some questions I'd like you to answer on those. And this is all straight out of the textbook. So you've got the questions in the book, um, which I would like you to answer. And I would like you to send me your answers. You can either do that with an electronic document or you can do it on paper and you can photograph it and uh, send it to me that way. I'd really prefer it if you uploaded it to class charts rather than sending it to me by an email because um, it's uh, just a bit more convenient for me to, to get all the files from, from each of you. Okay, so the first example is interference in sound. So um, this is an experiment which uh, we could have done in school, but we've got 
see from the diagram there, a signal generator, we've used a signal generator before, and connected to not one, but two speakers. So because it's the same signal going into two speakers, the uh, frequency of the wave is going to be the same. So that means the wavelength is going to be the same as well, which means that um, that's a, a coherent source if it's emitting a single uh, wavelength. So the sound waves travel out from each loudspeaker and those two waves uh, overlap and they form an interference pattern. So uh, what you can do is you can um, lay, say, a ruler on the desk near to the speakers and use a microphone and an oscilloscope. Do you remember we used an oscilloscope? If you can't quite remember what one of those is, then look back. Um, or you could use a data logger to measure the sound intensity. So the sound intensity would tell us about the amplitude of the wave. So where there was a low amplitude, it would be quieter. Where there was a bigger amplitude, it would be louder. And if we uh, made some measurements al uh, along that line, then uh, we could would find areas of maxima and minima. OK, so that's an, that's an example which uh, I'd like you to have a go at those questions, please. next bit so uh, microwaves so we're talking about electromagnetic waves here so um, this is a bit more difficult Be uh, co coherent microwaves more difficult because um, of the uh, the, the sh much shorter wavelength that we're, we're talking about so again um, to make it coherent what we're doing is we're using a single source and we're producing two um, making that to produce two essentially beams of light of that spread out in this case microwaves um, so we have a a pair of slits a double slit so as the waves hit the slit some pass through one slit the some others pass through the other slit so effectively we've got two sources it's a pair of sources of a coherent waves so um, as they travel out they will interfere and um, produce an interference pattern in very similar way to, to water waves. Um, and you can detect the uh, maxima and the minima using a, um, a microwave receiver. Instead of a microphone, a microwave receiver, and then again an, an oscilloscope or, or a data logger, a voltmeter. <clears throat> so again, there are some questions there which uh, I would like you to answer, please. So uh, finally, uh, an example for light. I don't know if you've ever noticed when um, you you get uh, water with with a small amount of oil, it only needs to be a few drops. Uh, it spreads out to form a thin film, and you notice it's there because it produces this uh, beautiful pattern of um, different colours, uh, and that that's caused by interference. So if you look at that that. Uh, figure seven I'm sure you've seen something like that at some point in the past um, if you want to try it at home then uh, get a small bowl put some water in it and then you want literally a drop of oil on it it works better against a dark surface um, and you can see this this um, this, this dif dif pattern of caused by the uh, interference of, of the light so what happens is this light shines onto the oil oil floats on water because it's less dense um, and some of it is reflected uh, some of it is refracted in other words it passes into the oil and when it reaches another boundary in other words the boundary between the oil and the water um, some of it obviously travels on is refracted again but some of it is reflected so the light, if you're looking at that, light which is uh, re reaching your eye, some of it has been reflected from the top surface of the oil and some of it has been reflected from the bottom surface of the oil. So that gives a path difference and the thickness of the oil at different places gives you um, different path lengths and so you get areas which are in phase and areas which are out of phase um, and causing that pattern. So uh, again, some uh, questions to 
answer on that. It's all in the textbook, so you don't need to be looking at this screen to answer those. Um, and then finally, uh, what I'd like you to have a go at are the summary questions from the textbook on these to check that you understand uh, what I've been through on there. Um, I hope that you've found this useful. Uh, I think this is probably better than just setting you a chapter to read and some questions to answer, which probably um, is uh, a bit heavy going, a bit boring. Um, it's not as interactive as being in a lesson because uh, you can't really ask me questions as you, as I go along. If you um, if you didn't understand something, you can obviously wind the video back and, and listen to it again. Uh, if you send me an email, if there's any bits that um, you're not quite sure about, I'll happily answer those questions and uh, I look forward to your answer to the questions. Good luck.